Dr. Donald Smith, which I'll tell you a little bit about my experiences with him in a moment, but also to Mama Sybil Williams Clark, who recently uh, left us, and most certainly as a graduate of the Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, I would be sorely amiss if I didn't mention Dr. John Henry Clark, who was my friend, my mentor, and my teacher. <laughs> The brother knew how to make it plain. And nowadays, we need to have some people who can make it plain. You know, I'm experiencing more and more uh, in the classroom, young blacks coming into the classroom declaring themselves not to be black and not to be African. <laughs> I'm seeing this more and more. And one of the things that Dr. Clark taught us, and certainly Blyden and Don Smith taught us, uh, was that we were Africans. And I'm going to declare myself right now so everybody know where I'm coming from. <laughs> I hope you all don't mind me talking a little bit of Ebonics here today. Okay? <laughs> so that everybody knows where I'm coming from. Thank I you. am an African. Thank you. And there ain't no compromise. No. There ain't no debate. Okay. All right? There's no discussion on that. I'm very, very clear about that. And just a couple weeks ago in classroom, I teach at Mega Evers College as an adjunct on Saturday, a course called African American History and Culture. And every now and then, I get a student that stands up and declares themselves not to be black, not to be African, and I've learned not to waste any time with that. If you are not black and you are not African, then I ain't talking about you. I'm talking about those of us who are. And I ain't wasting no time debating with you on any of that. And I say all of that to say that Don Smith was like that, and certainly Dr. Clark and Blyden, who I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. Uh, I got to meet, I got introduced to uh, Don Smith by Dr. James Turner and by Dr. Georgina Fowler. They both introduced me to, uh, to Dr. Smith and we became friends. And I remember the last time I saw him was at the home that he was staying in on off Central Park East, I think it was, right? And I went up there, I told Dr. Turner I was going by to see him. And I went up there, and the brother kept me up there three hours. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there. He had this huge TV on the wall. I don't know where, how he got that TV in there. <laughs> you know, he had me up there, and we're watching sports, and we're talking. And every time I told Don, I said, listen, Don, I got to be, wait a minute. <laughs> and we talked some more. We talked about everything. And so I really missed that. And then Dr. Turner told me that he had been transferred to Princeton, was it? Mm -hmm. Somewhere up there, and I couldn't make it up there before he passed. But... He was an outstanding brother and a great scholar. Uh, some years ago, maybe uh, 28 years ago, when I wrote my PhD dissertation, I wrote it on Blyden. It was called An Afrocentric Study of the Philosophy of Edward Wilmot Blyden. And in fact, I think I need to go back and publish that. I've written a lot of articles on Blyden, but I never published the, BA, of the PhD. And I think I need to go back and revise that and publish it. But I really got into Blyden through Dr. John Henry Clark. One time in Dr. Clark's house, we were having the discussions about history, and, and, and in fact, Mama Sybil was there also, and uh, Dr. Clark raised this person, Blyden, who I had heard about tangentially. You know, I didn't know much about Blyden, and I remember him saying this. He said, Blyden was so far ahead of his time that he's ahead of our time. <laughs> That's how far ahead of, he, uh, of, of his time that he was. And so I began doing some research on Blyden, and I found that Blyden was one of the little known characters of our history. He was the intellectual giant of the 19th century, bar none. That includes Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass, you name it, bar none. And he was the best known African in the world in the 19th century. And I thought to myself, if he's the best known African in the world in the 19th century, how come we don't know anything about him in the 20th century and not the 21st century? He laid a foundation for the coming of Marcus Garvey. And in fact, talking with our late brother Tony Martin, Tony Martin told me, I didn't read this in his book, he told me this, that Garvey has said that you couldn't understand the history of African people until you read Blyden. That's what Marcus Garvey has said. So when we look at Blyden, and it really there's too much about Blyden to talk about tonight, and if Dr. Lewin invites me back at another time, we'll do a whole lecture on Blyden. But, one of the interesting things about Blyden was, Blyden's history is synonymous with the history of Liberia. If you, you cannot study the history of Liberia during the 19th century and not study Blyden. It's impossible to do. Now, many scholars know the name Blyden, but they don't know Blyden. I've talked to many, many people. They know that name. He's like a tangential figure for them, but they don't know Blyden. And let me just give you a little background, just really quickly on the history of Liberia, for those of you who don't know, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Blyden and then move on. 
Liberia was founded in 1822 for many people who don't know. But what other people don't know was part of the founding of Liberia had to do with Paul Cuffey of the Cuffey Brothers of Boston. How many people remember or have heard of Paul Cuffey? I know many of you have, right? Paul Cus Cuffey scouted out Liberia. He went to Cape Miserato early on and wanted to open up a school for African people in Liberia. Before the founding of Liberia, Cuffey became the world's great authority in America at that particular point in time on Liberia. And so when the American uh, Colonization Society was founded in 1860 by Rob and Robert Finley was the first president, they consulted with Robert, I mean with uh, Paul Cuffey in terms of the development of this particular colony of Liberia. And in fact, keep in mind that the, most of the uh, presidents and directors of the American Colonization Society were all slaveholders. You know, it was a part of what many people considered to be the plot to drain off the free African population from here and so that you wouldn't have to worry about them in terms of the uh, permanence of slavery here. So, that's the background on Liberia. When Blyden was born in 1832, Liberia was already moving along. And what people may not understand was that Liberia, the blacks who went to Liberia, many of them who were mulattoes, octoroons, and quadroons and octoroons went there. What they brought to Liberia was the American racial system that was here and brought it there. Mm -hmm. And they established themselves over the blacks that were there as if they were white people. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay? So it's an interesting situation. So by the time Blyden gets there, there's going to be some problems. Once again, Blyden was born in 1832 and was educated in St. Thomas. The family originally came from St. Eustatius, and his family was free. Now, I do not know how they became free. I couldn't find out. There's no record of how they became free. But he grew up in the capital of St. Thomas. I was in St. Thomas a few years ago to visit the Blyden Society. And while I was there, I went to the actual house. The house is not there. The lot is there where Blyden family, uh, you know, where the house was, where they grew up at. And I spoke there to some of the members of the Blyden Society. Uh, the interesting thing is that <clears throat> Blyden grew up in the capital city, Charlotte Amelie, which primarily was Jewish. All right? And what's important about that is, through his observations of Jewish culture, Blyden came up with the idea if African people could be as tenacious with African culture as Jews were with Jewish cultures, culture, we would be on the road to something. This was the beginning of his education. All right, so he's being educated in St. Thomas. Uh, he's getting, at that time, a religious education by and large. All right, that's how they, at the, in the Danish islands and the Dutch, they gave black folk education, but it was primarily a religious education. And you went part of the day, something like from nine to 12, and that was it. And they were grooming black folks, not so much to be educated, but to be able to read the Bible mm -hmm. and to be able to preach the Bible, right? And Blyden did that. Blyden then comes to the United States to go to Rutgers University, well, Rutgers Theological Seminary. And while he's there, he can't get in because he is black. This is 1850, and I'll get to the point in a minute. 1850, he can't get in because he's black, and then he tries to get into two other universities and colleges in the United States, and he can't get in, once again, because he's black. So, a friend of his tells him about this new state in Africa that just got its independence called Liberia, 1847, all right? Just getting its independence, and Blyden's in the United States, 18 years old, in 1850, and something unusual happens in 1850. In 1850, they passed the Federal Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which means that any black is, is in danger of being taken into slavery. So Blyden finds out about this new state called Liberia and immigrates there, all right? And it's there that Blyden begins his career that sets the foundation or the framework or template for what, led, what would later become the Garvey movement. All right? Now, I'm not saying Garvey wasn't brilliant. I'm not saying he wouldn't have done all of these things on his own. But I refuse to believe it's inconceivable to me to think that Blyden's influence was not on Garvey. I mean, Garvey chose Liberia for a particular reason. All right? So while in Liberia, Garvey says to himself, I'm going to go to Liberia, continue my education, because he heard of a high school there called Alexandra High School, and he wants to go to continue his education. He can't do it in the United States. And he says to himself in his writings, 
I am going to Africa so that I can Christianize my heathen brothers. This is what he says at that particular point of 18 years old, right? And he gets there, and he begins to see certain things, a keen observer, just like Garvey was. Mm -hmm. You know, even before he got there, his family had taken him to Puerto Cabello, and he noticed that everybody in Puerto Cabello was doing, all the people that were doing the manual hard work were black folks, and they were never in positions of power. So this was the first inkling, just like Garvey did, in his first inkling of things. So he gets to Africa, and he begins to grow and to develop. He masters all of the various disciplines better than the European teachers that taught him. He studies and masters ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek. He becomes a scholar per excellence, and then he begins conceptualizing things that I think we need to go back and conceptualize. Forgive me for talking fast because I know my time is limited. You know, We need to conceptualize. One of the first things that he begins to conceptualize is what he called the African personality. All right? He begins to say that we, as African people, need a very distinct and definable personality. And when you think about it, we even need to do that now. All right? One of the things that I also often notice is that we are the only people in America, as far as I've been able to see, that have to append something to African. We have to say African-American, because if you say African, everybody says, you ain't African. You know, you got to append something. We're the only people that got to do that. If a person says they're Irish, they don't have to say American. If they say they're Jewish, they don't have to say American. If you're Chinese, you ain't got to say American. African people here, you have to append that so that people get to understand who you are. And many African people here, it's quite as kept, don't think they're African. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard enough to get somebody to think they're black. Mm -hmm. you know? And in the classroom, quite often, you, you know, when we start talking about and I understand the parameters of all of this. I've studied all of this, and all of this can be said. But you can tell by what people say and the sound of their voice in terms of how they say it. Because in my classroom, just like I get the black person that stands up and says, I ain't black. And I, sometimes I, I wish I had a mirror. You know, you see? <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, I also get the black person who every time you talk about being black, again, it comes up. You know, my grandmother was a Cherokee Indian. <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Well, then when the cop stops, you tell them that. <laughs> tell them your grandmother was a Cherokee Indian. That should help you out. <laughs> well, Black was one of the first people to grapple with this issue of the African personality and African identity. And in fact, Later generations, and even up until a very recent time, our good brother, Dr. Kobe Cambone, formerly Joe Baldwin, wrote a book called Assets in Psychology in the American Context, where he deals with this whole issue of a definable African personality, which Blyden goes on to define. And later on, in 1908, Blyden actually writes a book called African Life and Customs, when he talks about African life and customs, and he comes to a full appreciation of it. So he's very, very clear about it. Another important thing that Blyden did and again, at some point, Dr. Lewin, in the future, please invite me back so I can go through one, each one of these issues succinctly. He talked about an African education. Mm -hmm. Now, he's anticipated everybody on this. Mm -hmm. An African-centered education, but he doesn't call it an African-centered education. He says, we need to have an education that brings the African home to himself. Mm -hmm. right? And he goes on to discuss the African mind and the differences between the African and the European. All right? Now, this is before Dr. Malefi Asante, this is before Dr. Clark, this is before Garvey, this is before everybody. All right? Begins defining how we need to think about ourselves. And then when he becomes president of a Liberia College in 1881, 1880, 1881, he puts together a speech called The Aims and Methods of a Liberal Education, where he begins to define the parameters of African thinking and African thought. All right, so he's beginning to lay a template. Even Garvey, of course, looks back at this and begins to adopt certain things. Remember, the UNIA, originally the name of the UNIA was supposed to be the Universal African Improvement Association, right, and African Leagues. Garvey had to make it the Universal Negro in, uh, uh, Improvement Association because many blacks here didn't want to be called African. Now, I know you all remember that. Many of us who were old enough remember that when we were growing up, right? If somebody called you black, you were willing to kill them. Somebody called you African, I mean, they were good night. You know, you were going to do more than kill them on that. Mm -hmm. All right? So God, I mean, Blyden begins to formulate these, these concepts. Mm -hmm. All right? He was one of the fiercest critics of Christianity. 
at that time, what he called European Christianity. Blythe was a Presbyterian minister. Mm. He left the church and became what he called an itinerant minister of the truth. He gonna talk the truth. And this is what causes a lot of brothers and sisters who become Muslims to say that Blythe said that the black man's true religion was Islam. Blythe never said that, folks. Mm. I'm gonna tell you straight up, he never said that. He was a Presbyterian minister, but he was a different type of Christian. He wasn't a fool now. And he states this all the time. What Blyden actually said was that at least as compared to the Christianity he was exposed to, at least if Islam gave African people a certain semblance of their personality. Mm. All right? It allowed them to have a certain sense of their selves. That's what he said. And he coupled that with the education. By the way, Blyden was one of the first people, in fact, the only person that I know during the 19th century, that includes James Africanus Horton and any of the people who were attempting to do models of education. Of course, Horton's model of education was a European model for the Fanti and others. It was a total European model. Blyden was not. But Blyden was ahead of his time in the sense that Blyden said, the education of Africans must be an equal education for the men and the women. He said we cannot have a liberated Africa unless our women are equally as liberated as the men. Mm. <laughs> Go look it up. So he was putting together a model for African redemption and liberation, which he hoped Liberia would be the place for this resurgence of the African empire. This is what made it so attractive to Garvey when he come, came along. Garvey was born in 1887. And this, I mean, Blyden was born in 1832, 55 years before the birth of Garvey. Mm. So the template and the model is already there in terms of the thinking and the philosophy. Mm -hmm. All right? Garvey is not the per first person to say Africa for the Africans. Mm -hmm. You know? He's not the first person to say that. God, Blyden, and even Reverend Alexander Crummel and others, Timmy Highland Gardak, were all saying that because they all went to Liberia. All right? They all were saying that. It was Alexander Crummel and Garvey, I mean, and Blyden, that were at the founding of Liberia College in 1860, 1861. Right, it's not a college like this. At that time, it was nothing more than a building. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it was higher education as compared, compared to other places. Mm -hmm. And they had to grapple with the identity question. I hate to tell you this, but Blyden did not think that mulattoes, octoroons, and quadroons, uh, qua mulattoes, quadroons, and octoroons were, were black folks. And the reason he didn't think that or came to that conclusion because he said they weren't loyal to the race wow. in Liberia because they reproduced the same system that was here, there. And the double, the problem was, he was married to a woman who was a mulatto. And it gave him a hell of a time. Her name was Sarah Yates. She was the daughter of the vice president, uh, the, second, the first vice president of Liberia under J.J. Roberts. Remember, the first four presidents of Liberia College were all passing for white and acting white, mm. you know, which gave Blyden a bad reputation later on because he, whenever there was a black president, he must pay so much time, much time to the first lady, right, that he got a, a reputation for being a womanizer, which he wasn't. But he said to himself, I mean, how are you going to have a black nation and not have a black first lady? Mm. And this is where he was coming from. So. There were a lot of things that he was putting together in such a way to develop this idea of a strong African nation and African personality. So it was education, critiques of European Christianity, <clears throat> as well as the idea of the African personality. Unfortunately, Blyden was, like Garvey, a bad businessman. You know? He arranged for disastrous loans from England and other places that put Liberia into position to do those disastrous loans with the Firestone Company. Mm -hmm. That's how they got there, all right? Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, at the core of his philosophy are things that I think that we need to go back to and look at and rethink, refine them. You know, we can look at the mistakes he made because he made mistakes, just like Garvey made mistakes. But we need to go back and look at those things and rework them to a large degree. But by and large, at the core of it, in terms of his love for African people, in terms of having an African personality, again, as I said a few moments ago, I don't take, I don't, you know, I don't debate this. You know, I'm an African. It, there's, there's no debate there. That's Blyden. That's Garvey. There's no debate. There's no argument. There's no discussion. You, you don't get to come to me and say, well, uh, you know, you don't get to do that. I cut you off right away. 
you just don't get to do it. It gets me in a lot of trouble at my university because I'm known out there, as, since I'm basically the only one running a black studies department, uh, I'm known out there as a radical. And it gets me into a lot of trouble. But it also gets me a lot of respect because they know that when I'm around, I'm going to speak my mind. You know? I'm going to speak my mind. I had to do it recently when they denied Reverend Herb Daughtry the right to speak at the African Heritage graduation out there recently. Mm -hmm. So I let them have it on that. Mm -hmm. you know? But again, this would not happen without this background of a person like Edward Wilmot Blythe. By the way, his top title, Dr. Edward Wilmot Blythe, he could never earn the title of the degree of doctor. There was no place he could go and get it. So it was an honorary title. But in terms of his intellect, you know, he's like Leo, uh, Dr. Leo Hansberry. You know, couldn't get the doctorate, but the intellect is out there. By the way, uh, you should read uh, Hiawatha's new book, uh, uh, Baba Kameng Hiawatha, uh, his book on Leo Hansberry. And in fact, I'm just saying it because I wrote the review of it. Okay. So get a copy of his book, and uh, you'll see my review on, on the book and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to end right now, brother, because I know we have, uh, have to move. And I'm sorry for stuttering and moving so fast, but I'm trying to get a lot of stuff. I'm not even using my notes, so that's why. So let me end by saying this. Uh, Black, in one of his major speeches, said this. Your place in the universe was assigned to you as Africans. And there's no place for you as anything else. Thank you so much. Let's hear it again for Dr. Kanye. You know, you, you don't have to talk about speaking fast. You know, smart people speak fast. <laughs> okay. I speak slow. Okay. You know, smart, okay. Smart, smart people speak fast. Right. And don't worry about being a radical. I don't. <laughs> because I think, yeah. as Roger Wehrman right. pointed out years ago, to be radical in mathematics, the radical, you get to the root. Right. It's called a radical. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So you... And, and, right. But, but and you know, let me just say you're something. You're getting to the yeah. root of the problem. Let me just say something. In our terms, I'm not being radical. I'm being normal. Right. Yeah. Being African is normal. I right. ain't being radical. I'm being normal. There you go. Okay. There you go. There you go. Uh, in the present 